Well, good day, everyone, and welcome to Hudson Institute's virtual event. I'm Todd Lindbergh, Senior Fellow at Hudson Institute, and our topic today is a pandemic of deception, COVID-19 and disinformation operations. We'll be talking about the course of the effort to discredit and uh, obscure truthful information about the pandemic since uh, it began. And we've got a great expert panel to discuss this matter with us today. Uh, first, I want to uh, introduce uh, my old friend, uh, Dovidas Spukauskas, who's the uh, Charge of Affairs at the Embassy of Lithuania. The Embassy at Lithuania has been uh, helpful and uh, a great spur to putting this event on. And uh, I just wanted to say uh, hello and thank you personally, Dovidas, great to have you with us. Uh, thank you, thank you, Todd, and thank you everybody for, for deciding to, to do such a great event and on a, such a, an important topic. That's uh, that's always uh, been uh, of interest in, to our embassy. It had all, it's, all, it's always been a pleasure to partner with with the Hudson Institute, and the topic is is really really important. Uh, some call the actions that that the Russians now do with vaccines vaccine diplomacy. Frankly, I see nothing diplomatic about that. Uh, it's, it's just another way uh, of, of of pursuing their uh, you know politics of division. But what's even more concerning is that they are doing this at the time when, when countries and, and people are facing one of the biggest challenges of our time. So thank you for, for this discussion. I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing it. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got a great panel as uh, noted. Uh, I'll just introduce them in reverse order from the, that in which they will be speaking. Uh, from uh, Vilnius, uh, Oramus Pichikaitis. He's uh, an international news editor at the Lithuanian National Radio and Television. Uh, and he's a former Baltic American Freedom Foundation fellow uh, at Hudson Institute. Good to see you, Oramus. Uh, and uh, it's been it's it's been a while. Uh, Oramus uh, is a co-author of a paper uh, on uh, this very subject that uh, Hudson Institute published last summer. It's available at Hudson.org. Uh, Hello, everyone. Glad to be here. Uh, Sarah J. Gambarini is the policy fellow at National Defense uh, University's Center for the Study of Weapons of Mass Destruction. She has been uh, also been focusing very much on this issue. I'm sure we'll get a chance to talk to Sarah also about the connection of uh, information operations and disinformation operations with this question of uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction, massive mass disinformation. Sarah, welcome. Thanks for having me. Great. Uh, and my colleague, Richard Weitz, a senior fellow and director of the Center for Political uh, Military uh, Analysis here at Hudson Institute. He will be kicking off our uh, discussion today. Well, uh, Political warfare, disinformation, propaganda, et cetera. This is not new in the history of uh, the United States of America, our relations with Russia. Uh, it's becoming a new feature, I think, with regard to uh, some of our interactions with China. Uh, but uh, again, not, not an entirely new phenomenon. However, it does take place in a different kind of information age, one in which uh, the profusion of social media has allowed uh, information, disinformation, misinformation, propaganda, et cetera, to proliferate uh, in uh, extraordinary way, new ways uh, to reach uh, different audiences, to gather people together in mistaken beliefs in the view that they should propagate them and encourage others to adopt them. Some of this is organic. Some of it, however, is malicious. Uh, I can't think of anybody better to get the uh, discussion going than someone who has been studying this matter for quite some time, going back to the Soviet days. And so I'll ask uh, Richard to start us off with uh, uh, the big picture, uh, if you will. Thanks, uh, Richard. Right. Thank you uh, very much for allowing me to, to speak today. Uh, as Todd mentioned, I'm going to focus on three areas. So first, I'll briefly discuss how the Russian disinformation practices today differ from those of the Soviet period. Then I'm going to discuss how the disinformation operations during the COVID pandemic have differed from other campaigns by Moscow to influence foreign opinion. And then I will briefly compare the Russian and Chinese uh, approaches to disinformation. I think it's interesting that we're seeing the convergence between these two authoritarian actors. So first, uh, the comparison between Russia and the Soviet period. There are clearly some similarities and, and it makes sense because the, the Soviets uh, tried to put a lot of effort into psychological operations, disinformatia, uh, maskerovka or military deception. And so they naturally wanted to try and carry over these uh, practices that they thought were, were successful. 
but you've seen them if it being, if you will, upgraded, modernized to take into account um, some new advantages that they have, new opportunities they have, uh, both from uh, new, new modern techniques of political advertising and, and influence, the way you can influence consumers or voters to, to support candidates or oppose others. They've been adopted for, by the the Russians for, for political uh, disinformation and taking advantage of novel technologies, 24 hour news stations like RT, and it's particularly the internet. Uh, and for example, within that scope, social media, where you have individuals and group users who generate and share their own content is very susceptible to the Russian uh, uh, social um, disinformation uh, techniques, particularly, for example, their use of human staff troll farms. You can get people to go in and pr praise, damn, or elaborate on various comments by in, in social media contexts. In addition, you have these machine-generated uh, automated bots that can uh, basically put out uh, a particular message to many different user groups, many different audiences. Um, so you see, whereas in the Soviet period, it would sometimes take the Soviets years to, to be able to push a particular disinformation story, such as that the, the U.S. created AIDS, they had to place it in an Indian newspaper, and it took a couple of years before it was picked up by the Western press and became, got, got more attention. Now they can do this pretty much instantaneously. Um, and you've also seen a difference in a content in whereas the Soviets tend to favor falsified and biased information that promoted pro-Soviet perspectives. Now you see a more emphasis on, on taking advantage of these, the new technologies to, to push multiple storylines. So basically it's hard to know if it, what anything's true or anything certain. Um, so, so you know, when they could, it's you, if you don't like the narrative that Russian forces shot down a Malaysian airplane over Ukraine, you can just put out a bunch of stories saying, well, mate, you know, we saw this uh, G German uh, personnel in the area, or we, there was a, you know, dis we, we saw a story a year ago saying, let's try and make a false flag operation and so on. So they can, at the end of the, 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 end of the, the day, the idea is to make it, you, you could say, well, maybe the Russians did it, maybe they didn't do it. And they also tend to use conspiracy theories, misleading information, which we'll get into, I'm sure, later in the session. Um, so this, how does this, this differ, the practice we've seen uh, of Russian disinformation during the COVID period differ from that of other campaigns, such as the Russian attempt to influence US elections? Well, I think there are clearly some similarities. There's an effort, effort as, uh, to undermine trust and objectives and facts and credible information about COVID. Um, so you see contradictory messages uh, in, in pro-Kremlin print broadcasts and social media about is, is, how serious is the disease, how effective are various vaccines, uh, and so on. You also see efforts to cast uncertainty over the virus's origins, maybe came out of the United States, not China, and so on. Um, you also see the conspiracies that, that, that uh, may, this is just an effort by Big Pharma or Bill Gates to, to create a, a disease in order to enrich themselves when they push forward the developments, the treatments of vaccines and so on. Um, and a second theme you, you see as in other campaigns is this effort to say it's uh, portray democratic institutions as poor managers of the pandemic, not responding well in contrast to Russia. Um, and so uh, you, the, they would uh, highlight, for example, Russia's achievements in developing medical countermeasures and, that, and then the Sputnik V, v vaccine. The uh, effort is also by denigrating the performance of the Western uh, democracies. You can play upon tensions between EU members or between Europe and Americans. Claims, for example, that the wealthy EU members were not sharing enough of the virus with, with with uh, those less fortunate uh, claims that certain groups within, for example, the United States are being denied access to the, to the vaccine, whereas others, the wealthy, whatever, are getting privileged access. But there are particular, some differences between the, the, the disinformation campaign uh, this time on this occasion with this case as compared to earlier in, uh, ones. 
So you've seen, for example, this, this novelty of highlighting Russia's foreign medical operations. You had a lot of, for example, when the, the Russians sent biological warfare troops to Italy uh, in March to, to help out uh, with, the, with the response, they would highlight this and, and have hashtags and make a big effort to play this up. You've also seen an overt effort to exploit the crisis to remove sanctions on Russia and other countries. Um, this was actually from, led from the top, President Putin and other Russian leaders. President Putin, for example, during the G20 video summit in March 2020, said, you know, this is, this is outrageous. We have, we're, we're not allowing countries to have vaccines because of sanctions and so on, so we should remove them. Um, now, the focus of the campaign was on from Syria, Iran, North Korea, and so on. But uh, of course, if, if these sanctions weaken with Israel to these countries, it's, it's harder to hold them on Russia. And there were also attempts to exploit the fact, for example, the United States bought ventilators from Russia that were from a country that was on the US sanctions list. Uh, a particularly interesting difference between, from this one and earlier ones is that the, the disinformation campaign is much more opportunistic and indigenous in the sense that it's, it's it, unlike, for example, the 2016 U.S. presidential elections, whereas when the Russian entities created um, uh, a supposed America persona and, they, and these false persona then started spreading disinformation uh, about the camp candidates. This time, what they've done is they've gone into the US and other Western debates, picked out narratives they like, and then circulated them, manipulated them. So they found a, a something written by some American and some Facebook page, they would take it and push it out. On their own, on, on through their own controlled bots and and, and uh, other social media networks, uh, and it's more it's more effective in some ways because they're they're not having to create their own narratives, they, which made in Moscow, which are often seen as inauthentic by by readers. But if it's more if it's something that an American has already said, it's less harder to trace the origin to foreign influence. So finally, how is this disinformation campaign differed from that? Uh, uh, di differed in, in from in the case of China, China's information campaign this time versus previous ones, and in comparison to that of Russia. So this is the first time that the European Commission has actually identified China, along with Russia and other actors, as being responsible for what they termed a targeted influence operations and different disinformation campaigns in the EU and globally. Um, in the past, the, the China media managers would focus on uh, censoring undesirable narratives at home. But abroad, they were pushing more positive messages, you know, win-win cooperation. Uh, you sign a trade deal with China, you join our Belt Road Initiative, we're all going to benefit. Um, the, uh, and we saw this uh, somewhat. We saw them touting their successes at home and combating the virus and then, and then saying, and claiming that they were helping the world internationally by providing them with medical equipment and buying time for others' response. Uh, but we also saw them following the Russian practice of having a much more negative line in some cases, attacking other actors and using social media as part of their tool. I think this was because of the severity of the challenge. In a way, the fact that the, the Chinese Communist Party was unable to su uh, suppress information about this virus at home and then allowed it to uh, spread internationally really represented as a severe threat to the regime. It sort of undermined their claims to stewardship at home and, and, and reinforced all the concerns foreign countries have about China's international role, uh, making a positive contribution. So I think under pressure of this, they became much more aggressive. So you saw them at home uh, suppressing independent journalists, expelling foreign journalists, reinforcing social, social media censorship to get to push out this line that they effectively responded to the virus at home. And then internationally, you've seen them uh, much more aggressively attack the counter narrative in the West, which is that they, they covered up the virus at home and then through mismanagement and allowed it to spread internationally. And this is done by the Chinese diplomats, the so-called so wolfware warrior school diplomats who are much more aggressive in attacking the US and other uh, political leaders for spreading lies and, and disinformation and lashing out at the at Western media. 
Um, and you also saw them in, saw this in the traditional Chinese media. So they would have uh, news stories running, warning the Japanese that the US troops there were gonna spread the virus uh, to the Japanese population and so on. Um, but you also saw this more original use of social media accounts, basically creating a whole bunch of fake or hijacked accounts uh, in order to push out their message, uh, like the Russians, to lots of groups, lot on, on, and through at, at the same time, uh, and and we saw this orchestration most clearly when uh, through the foreign ministry, they would, uh, the foreign ministry spokesperson would put out a, a tweet saying, well, you know, maybe the, the Americans brought this from uh, in in to to, to China through the w military world games of October 2019, or maybe it leaked out of the U.S. Uh, lab, and then all of a sudden uh, uh, there would be all these uh, ambassadors in China and all these counts would start re reaffirming the same message. And in conclusion, I think we're going to see this continue, uh, even though this, I think that the Chinese are under, uh, I think that their current campaign has been more effective than their simple, uh, more passive approach in the past. And it allows China to take advantage of its uh, influence in, in controlling software apps. Uh, you know, TikTok's a great example, but uh, there are many of them. They're spreading throughout the world, it's information control techniques, and so on. So I, I, this may have been the first time we saw this massive uh, Chinese disinformation campaign like the Russians, but I don't think it's going to be the last. Thanks, Richard. That's great. Let me just ask one quick follow-up question, which is, uh, how dangerous is this? What is the goal? Well, I mean, it, it, in, in some ways, it can, it's extremely dangerous, right? Because if people believe some of these messages, they could die. So it, it's in a way, it's almost an opportune time for these kind of disinformation campaigns. We have a new virus, new pandemic. No, people don't really know a lot about this. We don't have any experience. Um, the scientists have been struggling to get a handle, and so naturally you're seeing diverse studies come out. Um, and so if people uh, don't, you know, if, if, so if, if people believe these things that the virus is a hoax or the vaccines don't work, then they're going to die. So that's, that's the most serious. Um, I think that the reasons for this differ somewhat. I think that the Russian campaign uh, was an attempt just as traditionally to exploit an opportunity to uh, weaken and embarrass Western governments um, to reaffirm Russia's uh, leading role in the world through its vaccines and foreign aid. Um, but it wasn't as much, uh, it wasn't as, uh, uh, as a full court press uh, as some of the other Russian campaigns. And I can explain later if there's interest why this campaign was perhaps less low, was more low key and, and not, not as successful as, for example, their intervention in the elections in 2016 and in some other cases. Whereas for the Chinese, um, you know, I think this was just a, a this was just because they the Chinese Communist Party rightly felt that there was a, this was exteriorly exposing the weaknesses of their their domestic practice of, of suppressing information that's not that the people up uh, higher up don't want to hear um and this there was a lot i think there, there well there are a lot of grounds for as some of our hudson colleagues to point out to blame china for this pandemic because of its the mismanagement at home and and, and allowing it spread abroad so i can see why the chinese have really been trying to defeat this narrative it's not only the information campaign we've seen this impose trade um, sanctions against for example australia and other countries who, who've adopted this or reports that the brazilian foreign minister uh, had to resign because the chinese were refusing to provide vaccines as long as he was there. So this, this has had, had a much greater impact, and in, in, particularly from the Chinese case, than many disinformation campaigns. Well, it certainly has uh, come as something of a revelation as the extent to which it is possible to put up campaigns like this. And, uh, and especially you know, when you're trying to deal with something novel, uh, namely this coronavirus, uh, in real time. Now, uh, Sarah, I want to turn to you now. You've been looking at this matter with, uh, at some level of granularity for some time now. Uh, let me, uh, let, let us know what you, what, what you think you've uh, uh, been able to conclude from, uh, from, from our experience in this brave new world. 
Great. Thank you again for having me. Again, I'm Sarah Gambarini. I'm a policy fellow at the Center for the Study of WMD, and I'm not here in my official pol policy position. This is not the position of NDU or DOD or the government. I have to give my little uh, caveat there. But in my research areas, I am looking at the focus of influence operations and WMD. And I'm particularly concerned when disinformation intersects with public health and have been thinking through some of these secondary biohazards of this social media weaponization, especially in this time of COVID. So a month before the global coronavirus outbreak was officially declared a pandemic, the WHO Director General acknowledged, we are not just fighting an epidemic, we are fighting an infodemic. Fake news spreads faster and more easily than this virus, and it is just as dangerous. So in this post-truth world that has normalized anti-science, anti-vaccine sentiment, the public health crisis of COVID-19 has been characterized by the spread of inadvertent misinformation and malicious and intentional disinformation. Countries have manipulated the information environment in an attempt to win the pandemic by framing themselves as responsible international actors and recasting the United States and its allies as the villain in the story. Russia, China, and Iran have made accusations that the coronavirus was created by the United States. So these conspiracy theories include that they, it was a US manufactured bioweapon targeting Iran, or that the United States is weaponizing the crisis to benefit its pharmaceutical industry, or that it was brought to Wuhan by US service members, as Richard mentioned. So increasingly, we are seeing vaccine nationalism with Russia, and this is amplified by China and Iran spreading harmful disinformation about American-made COVID vaccines to increase the share of the market for their own Sputnik, or in the case of China, Sinovac vaccine. And this is to gain power in this global fight to end the pandemic. And then there's the broader strategic goals. These are efforts that are part of an ongoing information warfare campaign by the Kremlin that has included deploying contradictory narratives about the United States and its allies and these have broader goals of undermining democracy, eliminating the US influence in its near abroad, sowing doubt and discord in societies and undermining trust in institutions of science and government. So while Russia, China and Iran are seeking to capitalize on this current crisis, their tactics are not new. Rather, America's adversaries are borrowing from an influence operation playbook developed during the Cold War. What's new is that the disinformation efforts now benefit from the speed and reach of modern media to rapidly shape and influence both opinions and actions across the globe. The United States is also particularly susceptible to these divisive narratives with an increasingly polarized society. Back in 2019, Russian General Valery Gerasimov gave a speech in which he called information technologies one of the most important and promising types of weapons, and not just to be used against infrastructure like we think about for cyber attacks, but against the population of a country, directly influencing the condition of a state's national security. So since the end of the Cold War, Russia has had to be calculating and creative to balance its economic, military, and technological disadvantages to compete with the United States, maximizing less conventional tools of war, including covert operations in the information domain. So in another example of the old becoming new and faster, the bioweapons allegations around the current COVID-19 pandemic are remarkably similar to those initiated and proliferated by the Soviet Union and its allies during the Cold War, including the Soviet-driven rumor in the 80s about the AIDS virus being a US biological warfare experiment. Now, these are capitalizing on anxieties that the members of the public have about a disease that seems to come out of nowhere. So they suggest that this fear should really be directed at the US government. So Russia's relying on these same Soviet era active measures, but with new prolific tools and how this plays out online, including during this pandemic has been by a fairly predictable methodology. Russia has leveraged its full disinformation ecosystem, including state TV, as well as social media bots and trolls to disseminate propaganda and flood hashtags to undermine pandemic response, amplify Iranian and Chinese bioweapons allegations and spread other hoaxes that links the origins of the virus to the US government. They rely on the power of narratives, focusing on simple messages targeting a cohesive group so that the message can be easier shared and further amplified. And when we're dealing with highly technical areas like viruses and vaccines, the level of expertise needed to show good science from bad science online is beyond a reasonably informed consumer. So this is a huge problem when people can't discern and disaggregate all the information out there about COVID-19. The average person will turn to their own bias and who they already trust. So lies that already match your sympathies or previously seen information are accepted. 
So Russia is capitalizing on the fear and confusion of this new disease. It, it's important to say that disinformation is rarely outright false information, but camouflage misleading information and facts, either partly true or at least plausible. And that's how they're able to be easily and knowingly unknowingly shared. Russia is making extreme versions of an issue mainstream and to sow enough confusion that people don't know what to believe. So we've seen Russia spread vaccine disinformation long before the COVID pandemic, including a campaign uh, in which the internet research agency deployed bots and trolls to spread disinformation about measles vaccinations in the United States. Now this has created long-term challenges for our country that we're seeing play out during the pandemic. Public health campaigns are built on trust. This type of attack is incredibly harmful. All of these anti-science messages that have made it difficult for COVID response, tainting everything from mask wearing to social distancing to vaccines. We're seeing similar tactics by Russia used on anti-vaxxers for measles being used to discourage American made COVID vaccines. Now, much like the mass diplomacy early in the pandemic, we're now in a new phase of propaganda and messaging or vaccine diplomacy. But the stakes are much higher. Convincing the world to take a certain COVID vaccine can mean huge financial or diplomatic opportunities in corners of the world that Russia would like to establish. And destroying faith in American and British made vaccines can have significant health effects for individuals and all of society if we can't get the pandemic under control with broad vaccine acceptance. Now, unlike their bioweapons conspiracy theories that were complete fabrications and other COVID disinformation that's built on a nugget of truth, vaccine disinformation is largely built around facts, taken out of context or otherwise misleading. We call this malinformation. They amplify negative stories about any of the American-made vaccines, particularly the deaths during the early Pfizer trials without the profit, proper context. And then they flood the zone with enthusiastic reports about the Russian vaccine. Now, this walks a fine line between a PR campaign and a disinformation campaign. But Russia has uh, conducted similar targeted campaigns in countries where it hopes will adopt the Sputnik vaccine, including Mexico, countries in Eastern Europe, Central and West Africa, using its RT affiliates in the region to spread disinformation and malinformation. This campaign started back in August 2020 when Russia first approved and announced its Sputnik vaccine using the same methodology we come to expect. RT and other state mouthpieces put out information along the theme that Russia's Sputnik vaccine is better than its American competitors, and then it's retweeted by other authorities, including Russian embassies in other countries. And the manipulated information proliferates and lends new legitimacy to the narrative. During the pandemic, we are seeing countries partner and launder information through each other. Russia will put out vaccine disinformation, China and Iran authorities and state media will pick it up. And then Russia will retweet that, making it seem like they have a second source. Another concerning trend that we're seeing during the pandemic has been these apparent partnerships and amplifying relationships among Russia, China, and Iran. China's disinformation use has historically been about domestic propaganda, as you mentioned, um, and message control, and really just creating the narrative that China and its authoritarian government are benevolent and powerful. But in the context of the pandemic, China has been borrowing from Russia's influence operations playbook moving from its initial propaganda type response in the early outbreak of downplaying and denying the disease, including silencing those who were speaking up about this novel coronavirus, and then moving toward these conspiracy theories that it was brought to Wuhan by the US military. And then also this mass diplomacy of promoting its effective response and highlighting its image abroad vis-a-vis -vis the US failed and irresponsible response. It's also concerning how Russia is picking up on China's methods during the vaccine rollout of actively promoting stories uh, that are positive to them and diminishing negative ones. It's much more akin to how we traditionally think about China manipulating messages. So we're seeing these adversaries learning from each other's tactics and even amplifying each other's messages. So how effective is this disinformation? It's really hard to tell because vaccine sentiment was already at a peak in our country when the pandemic hit. And the information landscape is so complicated and foggy that it's really hard to pinpoint blame on any one actor. But that's precisely why Russia has been so successful in acting with impunity and claiming deniability. But 31% of Americans say they will not get vaccinated. This number gets higher when you're looking at certain minority communities. And it's important to note that much like past Russian disinformation on public health issues like the AIDS epidemic, these false narratives 
have particular resonance among communities that have not only experienced disproportionate suffering from the pandemic, but also deep rooted experiences of racial oppression and medical abuse, which may predispose them to mistrust government institutions around health related issues. Similarly, one third of US military members say they will refuse the vaccine, which brings concerns about what this does for military readiness. This could potentially inhibit the military's ability to project uh, power abroad. The pandemic has shown how vulnerable forces are to contracting uh, diseases such as COVID-19, and there's renewed awareness of this threat by our adversaries. We must be thinking about what this does when our country and indeed the world is physically or economically weakened because we can't convince people to get the vaccine that would stop the pandemic. It goes back to this crisis of trust and lack of faith in science and institutions. But disinformation is not going away. It's cheap, it's effective, and it is achieving our adversaries goals. Especially as Russia is deprioritized in the United States list of national security threats, we should expect Russia to double down to remain relevant in this area where it has dominated, and that's the information environment. Great, thanks, Sarah. Could you you you've introduced a term that's new to me, which is malinformation. Distinguish that between disinformation, the, the other sorts of categories that we. I just like to hear a little bit more about that. It's quite interesting. Absolutely. So with disinformation, we really are talking about false information that has been manipulated and changed. You know, sometimes there will be a, a nugget of truth that's at least there so that people can accept it. It can't be so outlandish of a conspiracy theory. Well, sometimes they are. But, you know, there's usually some sort of kernel of truth. With malinformation, you take facts, but you take them out of context. You might even show a different image that has nothing to do with it a real non-manipulated image and put it together with um, a headline and it tells a different story. And so that's really what we're seeing Russia and then also China and Iran do during vaccine disinformation campaigns is they're just amplifying. It's more of a PR campaign, but that doesn't make it any less dangerous. Is there a, what, what is the degree of coordination that you see among Russia, China, Iran with regard to these questions? It's hard to tell how much it, 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 official uh, coordination there is, but we're certainly seeing similar messages come out, particularly when it comes to the pandemic. And the reason that we're seeing this is that this is a crucial opportunity and they are, they're, mar they're capitalizing on it. So we're definitely seeing similar information strains from Russia, China, and Iran. But what's interesting, at least during the vaccine disinformation campaigns, is that while they will amplify each other's negative comments about American-made vaccines, they aren't necessarily amplifying each other's positive stories about each other's campaigns. So we're still seeing a little bit of competition among China and Russia, especially as there are huge financial and diplomatic opportunities to be had. That's great, thanks very much. Uh, Oramus, uh... Welcome back to uh, Virtual Hudson. It's great to see you. Uh, you're uh, on the front lines, uh, so to speak, of, uh, uh, of, of this problem. Uh, and you've studied it at some length, not only for the paper that you wrote with uh, Richard, uh, but also since then. Uh, bring us up to date. What, what, have, what have you found? Well, uh, thank you once again for uh, having me end up well, while other panelists uh, cover the overall COVID disinformation campaign launched by uh, authoritarian countries, uh, I would like to shed some light on different features of uh, this messaging. Uh, it is right to say that the global Russia's or China's uh, disinformation campaigns have some general themes like showing the so-called superiority of authoritarian systems against democracies in dealing with crisis. But at the same time, COVID-related disinformation messages are adapted to different audiences and to uh, different circumstances. And I'd like to show that by uh, presenting uh, the case of Lithuania because, well, Russia's malign activities have gained attention in Western countries uh, in the last decade, especially after 2016 US presidential election. But in Baltic countries, uh, Kremlin's propaganda was well known before because, well, the region itself has been a, a target of Moscow's uh, disinformation uh, for years. Therefore, I would like to show uh, how infodemic was adapted to the usual targets in Lithuania and how COVID-19 has uh, created, well, new targets, new channels, methods uh, to spread this information. And well, afterwards, if I uh, have some time, I will uh, talk a little bit about how Lithuania deals with this infodemic. So there are several themes that are uh, usually used uh, or targeted in Russia's uh, disinformation operations against Lithuania. Well, first of all, propaganda aims to depict Baltic countries as uh, flawed states. Well, usually 
messages that are built up around this narrative include emphasizing uh, socio-economic problems like inequality, emigration, corruption, and well, Kremlin sells that that image both in his uh, for his domestic audience, but also to the citizens uh, try to sell uh, to, to the citizens uh, of Baltic countries. At the same time, Russia uh, disinformation uh, shows Baltics as fascist, Russophobic countries, and this particular theme was uh, well, for example, brought up in light of uh, events in uh, Belarus uh, this year and, and, and last year. But the message itself is also related with other propaganda elements like history distortion, which is one of the main activities of Russia's efforts recently, or stoking cultural uh, divisions between different uh, ethnic groups or divisions between liberal and uh, conservative camps on various domestic questions. And well, finally, there are some uh, international element in Kremlin's campaign, well, Lithuania's trans transatlantic direction, membership in NATO or EU, relations with the main strategic allies are targeted constantly. NATO mission soldiers usually become a target of disinformation also. And uh, for example, recently relations with uh, Poland was smeared in coordinated cyber and disinformation attack. And well, these messages are communicated through various sources of uh, Kremlin's disinformation ecosystem from TV programs, uh, which is usually one of the main sources of fake news in Lithuania, to Russian government funded uh, media like Sputnik uh, channel or uh, social media. And these activities can also overlap uh, or can be coordinated with uh, cyber attacks. For example, there are cases when certain news sites is hacked, fake story is planted, and then that say, fake story uh, is uh, being circulated uh, in social media. And last year, company FireEye analyzed the so-called Ghostwriter campaign and it's uh, 15 operations in Baltics and in Poland. And in that uh, campaign, uh, anti-Western themes were spread by using hack news websites, also using falsified quotes uh, or correspondence. And at the same time, this kind of content was spread in social media by inauthentic uh, fake individuals posing, for example, as journalists. So pandemic has become another opportunity for Kremlin and Kremlin associated actors to spread this disinformation. And by the way, last year, according to Lithuanian armed uh, forces, the amount of disinformation increased by 18% overall. And uh, COVID messaging, uh, well, is part of the reason why. Meanwhile, uh, State Security Department recently uh, in its annual uh, threats assessment emphasized that both Russia and China uses pandemic to discredit other countries. And according to that department, uh, in the internet, in Lithuania, more than a half of COVID-19 disinformation is related with Kremlin efforts. So by looking for the specific messaging, uh, Kremlin's backed uh, or funded media like Sputnik Channel is a very good example. So uh, in the beginning of pandemic, Sputnik uh, published articles casting doubts on the origins of the virus. So one ha uh, headline said that uh, this is a conspiracy, uh, like conspiracy uh, of 9-11. But eventually one of the well main uh, topics, uh, main theme uh, becomes the, uh, became the alleged Lithuania's uh, failure to uh, deal with the crisis. Uh, one headline, for example, claimed that there is a war uh, of all against all happening in Lithuania. And much of the coverage was related to the economic slowdown and claims from the so-called experts arguing that Lithuania's healthcare system has been destroyed. And this kind of narrative was also uh, tied up with the uh, messaging on uh, Russophobia. Like, uh, for example, it was claimed that Lithuania's, uh, Lithuanians misplaced their faith in Western countries and that COVID-19 travel restrictions on visitors coming from Belarus or Russia meant that tourism in Lithuania fell to, to stagnation. And I uh, have already mentioned that, that Moscow usually targets Lithuania's Western allies. So especially in the beginning of pandemic, EU solidarity was one of the main uh, targets by Sputnik propagandists. It was emphasized that Lithuania suffered uh, an unexpected attack of the virus that came from the Western countries. Later articles claim that Western Europeans are caring only about themselves uh, in the expense of uh, Baltic countries. And by the way, at the same time, Sputnik and other pro-Kremlin uh, media claim that Russia's uh, fight against the virus is successful and also, and also smeared the Western media and its reports on Kremlin's or Beijing's hacking or disinformation operations, calling these reports the so-called uh, sp spice mania. So these topics are dominating Sputnik channel now. Uh, with a different emphasis though. Uh, yesterday I reviewed the articles uh, from the Sputnik uh, in March and most of them are dedicated to the side effects of Pfizer and AstraZeneca vaccines, reporting the alleged deaths that uh, could be related to these jabs. And 
At the same time, article after article, uh, the success of Sputnik vaccine is uh, reminded with uh, quotes from the so-called European experts, institutes and uh, NGOs uh, saying uh, that European medicines agencies should uh, green light the usage of Sputnik. But speaking about Western alliances, well, NATO and NATO's presence uh, in Lithuania is the whole different beam in Russia's disinformation pool. On the one hand, Russian-backed uh, media claim that NATO collapsed against the virus, that NATO failed to fight against the virus because it's so busy competing with Russia. And on the other hand, uh, NATO's missions to Lithuania were targeted particularly. Sputnik claimed that uh, Europeans are angry about NATO exercises because they are afraid of coronavirus. And uh, one fake story about, uh, well, US soldier in Lithuania having COVID-19 symptoms were published in several Lithuanian news sites after they, have, uh, they had been hacked. So uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, also Minister of Defense and various news uh, outlets received a fake letter purportedly from uh, the NATO Secretary General alleging that Alliance uh, decided to withdraw uh, all NATO troops from Lithu Lithuania. So these kind of uh, techniques fall in that set of Kremlin strategies analyzed, as I mentioned, by the FireEye company. And what is probably uh, a bit more inherent to COVID-19 disinformation is the usage of social media in Lithuania. So in Lithuania's case, it's uh, first of all, Facebook groups and uh, uh, YouTube vloggers. Uh, they are related uh, to more uh, traditional conspiracy theories, alleging that COVID is a hoax or vaccines have uh, those 5G microchips and so on. And, some of these uh, groups gathered tens of thousands of followers in the beginning of the pandemic, and they tried to organize anti-quarantine events, uh, share distortion stories. One of more recent uh, tactics is to share fake confessions by journalists or, or medics saying that the COVID-19 is a hoax and that they are forced to lie about the virus. Other recent tactic is to share the fake screenshots uh, with the fake headlines from the mainstream media alleging that, well, for example, vaccination is going to be mandatory in Lithuania. And what is even more worrying is that uh, some of these French uh, theories are embraced by some local politicians, like uh, some MPs and uh, businessmen who organized the anti-vaccination or anti-quarantine conferences in the past. Now, it could be hard to distinguish these kinds of conspiracy uh, theories from the Russian-backed disinformation. But uh, firstly, these kind of messages, well, they are useful for Kremlin. Uh, and as state security department suggests, Kremlin uh, propaganda or fake news about vaccinations influence these uh, conspiracy theorists uh, in social media. And moreover, these groups include fake accounts or bots that not only share misinformation, but well, for example, spam comment sections under the articles from the mainstream media or posts uh, from the official government institutions. And well, eventually the pure uh, Kremlin backed narratives begin to spread in some of these groups. Well, users start to spread lies about uh, Soviet history, defend uh, the Crimean annexation, smear US politicians. So in other words, if uh, the medical experts talk about long-term effects of COVID-19 disease for humans' uh, body, for humans' health, we can also talk about the long-term effect of these social media groups uh, after the pandemic, uh, uh, infodemic and pandemic ends. And well, I'd like to wrap up here by quickly running through Lithuania's uh, efforts in dealing with the infodemic. So on the one hand, uh, these social media groups, as I mentioned, gathered tens of thousands of supporters. Uh, officials also warned that these groups could be quite uh, efficient in organizing events or protests actions. Also, uh, it is also worrying that in the regions dominated by ethnic minorities, vaccination rate is lower, and it could also be related to Russia's efforts because, well, Russian-speaking minorities are less resilient to Kremlin's propaganda. But on the other hand, Trust in NATO, NATO's presence remains strong. Majority of people are still willing to, to get uh, vaccinated. And according to uh, the polls, uh, number of Lithuanians who say that they can, that they can identify uh, disinformation grows. And uh, if we look to the efforts in uh, combating the disinformation, well, uh, Strategic Communications Department that is part of Lithuanian Armed Forces constantly monitors the information flows, uh, shares their insights and reviews uh, with media, educates the public or assists uh, other public institutions like uh, health ministry. And at the same time, leading uh, mainstream uh, media outlets run the fact-checking segments on the pandemic. And even before the COVID-19, experts, uh, volunteers, and government specialists launched a project which is called Damaskwak, or in English, it's debunk, with the effort to uh, well, debunk uh, propaganda myths. And speaking about the volunteers, 
there are some social media groups that uh, call themselves uh, elves that are fighting the so-called uh, social media trolls. They share information about the trolls and well, collectively later they report those uh, so-called trolls to uh, Facebook. Mm, fascinating. Wait, would you say that we are improving in, or the, or the, I should say, would you say that Lithuania is improving in its ability to respond to these things? Is it important to respond quickly? Do you need to respond in mass? How, how do you how do you approach that kind of set of questions? Well, I think that government is spending more and more time and, and efforts to educate people about uh, about that this, about this information. And as I as I mentioned, what polls show is that uh, well, people can uh, more and more they uh, they improve their ability to distinguish uh, fake. Uh, news from the real news, uh, what is coming, let's say, from uh, the Kremlin's propaganda machine. But I also should add that there is a uh, there is a difference between the disinformation that uh, comes uh, through the internet, through social media, or uh, news outlets, and from uh, TV. Because well, the main source uh, of propaganda in Lithuania is uh, well Russian TV, so to say, and to measure the effect uh, of uh, this kind of disinformation or resilience to this kind of, of, of disinformation is quite, uh, quite, uh, quite not easy. Yeah, no, that's, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I think all of us are beginning to understand better the nature of the challenge that this poses, not only the, uh, the, the sophistication uh, of the effort to undermine uh, confidence in truth as such, uh, but also, I think, the specifics of the means of attack and the way in which it's possible to gather allies. Sarah, I, I wanted to ask you, when you look at the, this, how much new is going on here? And, and of what's going on here that is new, how much of it is related to the media environment? And you could probably guess what the follow-up question to that is, which is, what do we do about it? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because we see so many similarities that, you know, the way that the Soviets even did this. So, you know, we're seeing this through line of active measures, but there are new things. Just this last year, it was uncovered uh, a six year uh, disinformation campaign out of Russia uh, that was dubbed secondary infection and in, uh, homage to uh, Operation Infection and what it was the disinformation around uh, the AIDS virus in the 80s. But in this, what was uncovered was a lot of the same things that we would expect, anti-US, anti-NATO, pro-Russia narratives, but there were some interesting tactics that were unexpected, including that Russia didn't feel the need to build and create new forms of narratives, what they did was they really relied on what was already there and amplifying the disinf the conspiracy theories that are homegrown, which sounds really interesting and sounds like maybe some similarities in the Lithuanian case. And then another thing that we really saw out of this case was that Russia didn't feel the need to create these uh, inauthentic personas online, these bots and trolls with a following and trust, they would create burner accounts and let them put out a misleading tweet and then they would abandon it. Um, realizing that Americans media literacy is so that they will not click to see what has this person said before. They will just allow you know this trust in something that's never even built up any kind of uh, online uh, personality. And, and so they're really calling out our media illiteracy. And so I think that this is going to get faster and, and more, more prolific uh, going forward. And then going for, you know, to your next question about what do we do about it? You know, this is something that it's going to have to be such a whole of society, a whole of alliance uh, project that we're going to have to really start at the very basic of media literacy. And, um, you know, it, it's such a cheap an effective method that we can't rely on deterrence. Russia is going to continue to do this. So it's really gonna to have to come down to inoculation and media literacy and understanding what, what our adversaries are doing to target us online. Yeah, and Richard, if you were advising the Biden administration on this subject, for all I know you are, um, what would you say is job one, job two, job three with regard to this initi these initiatives going on? Well, building on to Sarah, I think that it's going to require a multi-pronged approach. We have seen progress, though, in the last four years. I think we were caught unawares, or at least most of us were, by the, the extent of Russia's involvement in the 2016 election. So this time around, 
we saw the federal government uh, take a much more active approach, including apparently preemptive spoiler attacks on Russian sites that they feared would interfere with the elections. Um, we've seen, I think, to give credit where credit is due, that the social media companies are now much more aware. In 2016, the line was, oh, you know, there's no way Russia could use our platforms to influence the elections. You're just exaggerating. Now they readily acknowledge this problem. Every couple of weeks or so, I get a notice from Twitter or Facebook or say, oh, we've discovered this inauthentic network in which 30,000 Chinese bots were interlinked. And we could tell that they were false because they were all putting out the same message. And, and, and you know, if you look deep down the code, you can see it's similar to what China used in this earlier case. So I think they've become much more effective. Um, I think that uh, the, uh, the government is also beyond the, the uh, cyber realm. I think you've seen the State Department, for example, be much more uh, engaged in publicizing their understanding of the Russian networks or some good reports on their website about the, the Russia disinformation ecosystem, the different elements and they, you know, which, which publications and authors are probably linked to it. Um, and then lastly, um, I think that the, the think tank community has been doing a better job. I think, you know, we wouldn't have had this kind of event a few years ago, but uh, Hudson and, and, and other think tanks in particular, uh, I would, I would, you know, some, maybe the German Marshall Fund with their initiative has been taking a lead in um, basically providing extensive information on what is happening in, in with these countries and in Europe and Asia. So our defense has improved. And I think we need, we'll need to continue these efforts, but I think in the end, Sarah is right. We're, we're not, the, the, it, this, this kind of interference is so cheap um, and, the, and it's really hard to, to, figure, to retaliate effectively. I think Russia, China, uh, Iran, North Korea, presumably, uh, anyone who's angry at the US or wants to cause us troubles to intervene. So we really need to focus on our defenses, our um, spreading awareness of this problem. Um, but I mean, this is going to be an ongoing struggle like, like a, a typical Cold War decades long uh, and, and, uh, conflict. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ormus, what, uh, what, what do Lithuanian schools teach children about the information environment uh, and the, uh, the disinformation danger that, uh, that comes from Russia? Is this something that is, that is actively, in other words, is there, is there an active effort to make uh, young Lithuanians aware of you know, the situation that they're actually facing? Well, actually, there are a lot of uh, civic uh, organizations that uh, doing this kind of activities, like sharing uh, the, the examples of uh, Russian disinformation, or just uh, doing the civic education on those uh, most important topics. But also in universities, uh, there's, a, there's a bigger awareness of, of, of what uh, Russia is doing. But I think, well, I, I can only agree that uh, in the future, it uh, could be harder and harder because, well, philosophically speaking, uh, even with a pandemic, uh, the post true, we see that we live in the post truth uh, world when the uh, scientific facts are doubted. And uh, well, I think that in, in terms of pandemic, government can find uh, uh, like more easier approach uh, in combating this information. Like it, the, the, the key is uh, uh, government's uh, communication, accessible uh, communication to every citizen, direct communication, clear communication about vaccines, about the lockdowns, about the other measures. But when we talk about uh, uh, questions, political questions, social questions, it's uh, going to be even harder. And uh, in, in, in the face of the pandemic, if we talk about, let's say, European Union, the differences between the countries, like, for example, Hungary using uh, Sputnik vaccine, well, it's, it's, it's going to drive a, a wedge. And when we see the, the, this, this kind of uh, little conflicts building up, well, Russia uses it uh, very, very easily because, well, in the past and uh, and now in the present, what Russia really does, it it, it really uses the the chaos or, uh, as I said, any conflict. Yeah, yeah, I don't like that phrase, post-truth environment, 
And the reason I don't is because I'm still on um, Truth's side with regard to these things. And the truth is that other people are lying and misleading. And uh, so I don't, want to, I don't want to surrender to a world in which there's only narrative. Because if there's a world in which it's only narrative, it's just about how good a story you tell, whether it has any connection to truth or not. Uh, so I wouldn't. Uh, I, my 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 little uh, contribution to uh, to the what to do aspect of this is actually to hang on to the uh, to the truth claims that uh, we uh, that we that we can make, and that come that raises unfortunately a, you know a kind of a, an awkward question. We all know the phrase from the Soviet era: uh, "Useful idiots." Um, what do we do, Sarah? Uh, about our fellow Americans who I think without any degree of particular malice kind of get taken in. How do you, how do you reach them? What do you do? Yeah, that's the exact right way of framing this is that so the Russians are actually using us as their useful idiots to spread this misinformation and from person to person. And we've seen that, especially during the COVID pandemic. And it's a, a huge challenge. And it goes back to what you were saying about this post-truth world. Well, there's a difference in facts and opinions in truth. So, you know, really focusing on what a fact is, especially when we're talking about science. I think that one of the ways that we can really accomplish this, because one of the problems with spreading misinformation online from person to person, you know, with no malice, believing it to be true, is that once somebody has accepted that as their truth, then it's very hard to eradicate it from their mind. And so I think that this is where the hyper-local solution is going to have to come into play. We're going to have to work, you know, maybe use the word influencer, but hyper-local influencer, someone within their community who they trust because this is the problem. No, no amount of big government uh, program is going to convince them that their truth is not what they should believe. So really working with community members, religious leaders, people who are in their community who they can, you know, already has that trust established to be able to share information, use vaccines for an example. It is a fact that a vaccine, you know, it will end up ending this pandemic and it will be a good thing for our society to do. But to get past all of the misinformation, I think it's going to have to be, um, you know, finding those people in every community that can um, spread that message and then have it really be accepted. Because otherwise we're just, we're going against a brick wall in terms of trying to convince people of something that they've already made their mind up about. So the solution is in some sense, this, uh, this very localized um, effort to communicate with people who, who, who are in possession of truth and it can be communicated in a fashion in which uh, the people will receive it uh, trustingly. What about- Right, and I'll say, that, I'll say that local has a different meaning when we're all online. There are little communities that might be diverse um, geographically, but you know, that trust is there and, and that that's where we need to be targeting. And I, I do think one of the uh, interesting things that we've learned during the Zoom era is how easy actually it is to convey, uh, to, uh, to convene people in very different locations uh, for events uh, such as this, uh, with uh, Oramus uh, joining us from uh, Vilnius, uh, et cetera. Uh, R Richard, same question to you, but more or less at the strategic level. And we only got two minutes left, so I, if, yeah, uh, go for it. So um, I think that one good initiative we've seen uh, starting with the Trump administration, but particularly recently on the Biden administration is trying to work with allies and partners since the information defenses are only as strong as the weakest link. So working, I think the U.S. has been working uh, with the Baltic states, but also you know, Europe. We've been working with uh, Australia and uh, other partners. Uh, to try and reduce the, the threat. And this is including uh, sharing information about information threat uh, challenges and, and mis misinformation, um, reducing reliance on, for example, Chinese information technology that could present a, a vulnerability in this regard could facilitate that spread. So I think working forward with our European, Asian and other partners, I think that's we're gonna see uh, some progress from that strategically as well. Great, thank you. Uh, Oramus, Pichikaitis, Sarah Gambarini, Richard Weitz, thank you so much for uh, joining and uh, making this discussion happen. Uh, and again, my thanks to the uh, Embassy of Lithuania in Washington. And as for me, I shall go get my second dose of the Pfizer vaccine tomorrow. So signing off, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.